Yeager, and I'm uh, I'm uh, a pediatric neurologist from from Canada. So, if you head due west by about ten thousand kilometers or so, you'll uh, you'll wind up in my in my backyard. Um, and I want to also uh, obviously um, thank the organizers, George and Janusz, for uh, inviting me here. I've been involved with Hippocrates, I think, now for about four years. And it's been uh, one of the best experiences of, of uh, my career, actually. I think it's uh, one of the most brilliant ideas about um, teaching uh, neonatal uh, aspects of disease uh, across the world. And my hat's off to George for... Um, for um, founding this organization because it's it's fabulous for the lecturers. Uh, we hope it's fabulous for um, the attendees and uh, it's really a great time. So uh, enjoy the lectures uh, and enjoy your time in Krakow as I certainly will. Uh, we were just commenting, I came with my brother. Uh, my connection is that my, my actually my whole family is from uh, various parts of uh, Poland. So we want to take this opportunity to sort of uh, explore Krakow and the rest of Poland and uh, see where our roots have, uh, have come from. And, uh, and we we're mentioning, because I came by train, that the countryside is extremely, is very much the same as actually Midwest uh, Canada, which is fat, uh, flat, not fat, flat <laughs> and, uh, and uh, full of snow right now. So we're pretty much, pretty much on the same level. I'm always a little bit intimidated by talking to uh, an entire room of neonatologists as a, neonat as a pediatric neurologist, because I'm usually the exemption. And, uh, and so uh, bear with me as we switch uh, to the brain, which uh, pediatric neurologists kind of think everything uh, hangs on. So everything's about brain. And uh, I'll relax a little bit, take my jacket off. Please feel free to ask, ask any questions that you might have as we go through. And I think my job over the next few days is to sort of give you an idea about number one, today we're going to, or this morning we'll talk a bit about what we think causes brain injury in uh, our newborn babies. And over the next couple of days we'll talk about what we can do about it. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with hypothermia and I think um, uh, there'll be another talk on the ICE trial and I'll give you an overview of that. And then some of the simple things we can do and some of the more complicated things that are being done around uh, brain protection, which has really, really exploded in the last uh, decade or so, and I think is going to, frankly, uh, explode even more exponentially over the next uh, 10 and 15 years. So old guys like me, uh, who've been around for the last 20 years, and you know, haven't been able to do a whole lot for babies and babies' brains actively, that's going to change for those of you who are just entering their careers or in mid-career, and we're going to be able to, I, I think, do uh, a tremendous amount. So uh, I have no disclosures other than to say that um, if you fall asleep now and don't hear anything I have to say, then what I want you to walk away with, the take-home message, is to read these papers because these are fabulous reviews uh, by, by well-known uh, um, authors in the, in the field. Uh, most people know who Joe Volpe is. Steve Bax has done the, um, all of the work, uh, really, on uh, white matter injury and oligodendroglia in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Bob Venucci, who I trained with many years ago, is the grandfather of the... Um, uh, of the uh, rat pup model that most of us use around the world. And Michael Johnson is uh, certainly uh, one of the other exemplary uh, um, neonatal neurologists who, um, who's been doing tremendous work in the area of brain and brain resuscitation. So like I say, if you fall asleep now, uh, but you're able to take down some of those references, uh, you're good to go. You, can, <laughs> you don't have to worry about anything I have to say. So what we'll try and cover in the next, uh, in the next uh, uh, 50 minutes or so is I'm going to talk a little bit about what perinatal brain injury actually means, uh, what we believe is the underlying epidemiology uh, for it, and of course there's no single, uh, one single bullet, the patterns of brain injury and how they evolve over time, which many of us know. We'll discuss some of the mechanisms of uh, injury and cell death, and uh, we need to ask ourselves how an understanding of these mechanisms can obviously lead to therapeutic intervention. 
because that is actually changing. And what's happened, I think, uh, appropriately so, is that we recognize that the you know the the newborn and the developing brain is just is rapidly evolving. So we can no longer, as we have in the past, you know, develop a, a drug for ischemia or stroke in the adult and assume it's going to work in a newborn or or, uh, or a young uh, young infant. That's not going to happen, and in fact, it's probably quite dangerous to do so. So we're we're really looking at a revolution and a mind shift in how we're treating newborn babies and uh, young children and and looking at a very patient-specific and age-specific type of therapeutic intervention. And many of you know that, of course, because you've been focused on the newborn for many, uh, for many years. But those of us who sort of deal with pediatrics in a broader range recognize that adults like to think that uh, kids are just small adults. And we all know that they're not, that they're very rapidly evolving and we have to be, uh, pay special attention to, what they, to, what, um, to their needs. So what is perinatal brain injury? Where the term perinatal, I've, I've often found when I'm talking to different people, seems to evolve around the time of birth. But, it, but in fact, it's not around the time of birth. It really extends all the way from uh, five months before birth, or in the uh, end of the second and early third trimester, all the way to a month after birth. So when someone says perinatal brain injury, we're not really talking about brain injury around the time of birth. Most of the lawyers, at least in my country, like to think that, but, around, but it's not, that's not really what a definition is. And the WHO classification is really any uh, infant with a birth weight that's greater than, uh, than 500 grams. So we're talking about a very large period of time in the development of a, ba of a baby, and particularly in the development of a baby's brain. And when we look at that, if we look at the development over the last uh, trimester, we're looking at a monstrous uh, change and evolution in what a baby's brain not only looks like, as you can see, if we start at the end of the second trimester and evolves over time, you've got the development of a huge number of sulci, a lot of folding going on. The surface area of the brain actually uh, uh, triples in, in, uh, in surface area. So the developmental aspects in the last trimester, uh, trimester are huge. Most of the migration and things like that have occurred, but synapses are forming, uh, dendrites are forming, uh, and you, you can tell just by looking at, at that evolution why injury at 24 weeks may look a little bit different than it does at 36 weeks, because you're really looking at an entirely different brain. You're no lo longer looking at a, at a simple brain. And what, do we, what does perinatal brain injury usually refer to? Well, it's, it's not just um, one thing, it's many things. Perinatal brain injury is uh, hypoxic ischemic in nature, it's traumatic, intraventricular hemorrhage, PVL, infectious, toxin, uh, metabolic, and genetic. And if we talked about all of those things today, we'd be, I'd be here till 4 or 5 and into tomorrow night. Uh, so today, I'm just going to focus on hypoxic ischemic injury or, um, or ischemic injury or asphyxia, depending on what terminology you really like, and we'll, uh, we'll focus on that. Just to sort of put this into context, most papers, most, most manuscripts, most when people talk about hypoxic ischemic injury, they usually use cerebral palsy as a sort of the sine qua non outcome parameter. In other words, uh, neonatologists and pediatric neurologists talk about hypoxic ischemic injury, but uh, developmental pediatricians talk about cerebral palsy. And really, they're sort of the continuum of injury to outcome. And that's sort of the sine qua non. So when you're trying to figure out, well, what is the outcome of uh, hypoxic ischemic injury, and you try and look at the literature, it really is under the heading of cerebral palsy. And that definition has actually also evolved over time. And it, it's an important evolution because when, 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 when people talk about cerebral palsy, they usually talk about, and this is the uh, consensus, consensus definition from 2007 that actually the Australians play, and Europeans played a big role in, but it's a permanent disorder of development of movement and posture causing activity limitations to non-progressive 
disturbance in, in the developing uh, brain. So most of us think of cerebral palsy as a movement problem. But in fact, it's much more than that. And they've um, expanded this to say that it's accompanied by disturbances of sensation, perception, cognition, communication, and behavior, ep uh, including epilepsy and, and uh, other aspects. So that's extremely important because it really brings uh, into effect aspects of uh, cognitive impairment, which we all know intuitively occurs in children with cerebral palsy, but it really wasn't ever recognized as uh, part of that definition. So cerebral palsy, we all kind of know what that is. Uh, we also know it hasn't really changed much in the last uh, 20 years in terms of incidence. It's still between about uh, one and a half to two and a half per thousand live births. And in spite of great obstetrical care and great ne uh, neonatal care, that incidence hasn't really uh, changed all that dramatically. The uh, sort of experiments that were done, well, not really experiments, but when the inci incidence of cesarean section went up dramatically about 10 years ago, and people thought we would rid ourselves of cerebral palsy, didn't happen. Um, so there's something else going on. Uh, and one of the other things, of course, is that what we're seeing uh, is prematurity, or the instance of uh, surviving babies is certainly increasing. And in spite of the fact that in term infants, the instance is only about two per thousand. In preterm births, it's uh, 22 per thousand. So it's almost 10 times as great. And that number is coming, that number is actually coming down because it was much, much higher in the previous decade, but it's still 10 times as high. So this population of premature babies is really what is contributing to uh, outcomes of cerebral palsy nowadays. And it's not uncommon for us to see uh, uh, epidemiological people suggest, uh, papers suggesting that the incidence is actually increasing because of this, um, because of the, uh, the survival of premature, uh, premature babies. And what, what uh, causes cerebral palsy or, uh, um, and perinatal brain injury? Well, we now, I think, all recognize certainly that it's uh, some, somewhat of a continuum. Obviously, because it occurs uh, from uh, in, in babies who uh, survive at 24 weeks of age to uh, really in the first month of life. Uh, there is now, I think, recognized that there's probably not a silver bullet. It's relatively rare to have an obstetrical uh, trauma uh, result in cerebral palsy. It's not unheard of, of course. About 10% of uh, kids with cerebral palsy do uh, result from obstetrical uh, trauma, uh, which just means a difficult uh, delivery. But the remaining 90% probably happen because of antepartum uh, uh, insults. Or at least uh, something, well, so 10% so may happen interpartum, but uh, uh, about 65 to 80% of them will occur as a result of an antepartum, either in conjunction with an interpartum insult or as an antepartum uh, insult in and of itself. And this can include abnormalities of genetics, toxins, uh, infectious etiologies, et cetera. And we won't focus on all of those, uh, but I think the important thing is to recognize that there may be more than one hit, and many of those hits actually occur uh, prior to the time of birth, not really around the time of birth. Uh, and so that changes how we think we might be able to approach or treat these babies. So even with uh, hypothermia being as successful it is, as it has been, and it, it is one of the only things that has been successful in terms of treating uh, any type of ischemic injury, including in adults. Uh, and so in newborns, we've been uh, really uh, very um, fortunate to be able to do that, is still only really approaching 10% of that population that does have some kind of uh, obstetrical uh, difficulty. And so we have 90% of the children who eventually get cerebral palsy who we still don't know really what to do with and don't have an, a therapeutic um, approach. And that results in a continuum of injury. So we're all very familiar, I think, with uh, some of these aspects. Certainly in the preterm baby, we tend to see periventricular leukomalacia or white matter injury uh, between 24 and 32 weeks. As we get more towards the term infant, we tend to see the injury moving from the subcortical white matter 
more to the cortical gray matter in the form of um, basal ganglia injury uh, or uh, selective neural necrosis in the cortex. And sometimes we see that as a so-called neonatal uh, or term stroke. And when we look at babies' brains, uh, we see the cystic um, abnormalities around, around the ventricles as a result of uh, white matter injury. We can sometimes see cortical uh, infarction. And of course, if the duration of the insult is uh, very long, then it affects the whole brain, both subcortical and, and cortical, and results in uh, spastic diplegia or uh, quadriplegia. And clinically, it's not too surprising that when we see babies who have either diplegia or quadriplegia uh, resulting from um, uh, periventricular leukomalacia, it's because they're interfering with the, with the tracts that, that go down from the cortex through the corticospinal tract and into the uh, spinal cord. So if you have an injury that involves the whole cortex, that's going to cause spastic dire quadriplegia. But even if you have a smaller injury around the ventricles, it'll result in really the same phenotypic kind of uh, outcome. So the baby may appear uh, the same. The important aspect is if it's restricted here and spares the cortex, uh, I think what we're finding is that many of these children actually have much less cognitive interference than you might expect by their appearance. And so a lot of them are kind of locked in to their wheelchairs or to their uh, motor difficulties and really understand a lot of what you're saying but have no way of expressing that. And so new technologies and new abilities to help those children communicate are really uh, making, I think, a difference in terms of what, what they can do and what we understand about them. And then you have other forms of cerebral palsy in, the, term, in uh, the form of stroke that are more likely to be hemiplegic and are more likely due to the occlusion of a single vessel. And these can certainly occur around the time of, of birth when you get a middle cerebral artery infarction uh, or sometimes... Uh, intrauterine, where, where you'll get a periventricular venous infarction, uh, much like a, a IVH, but into the cortex and into the um, periventricular uh, white matter. So just, um, just to give you an idea about when, when we see these kids or when you see them in neonatal follow-up clinic or we see them as neurologists or developmental pediatricians see them, um, cerebral palsy has been nicely grouped by, by our group in, uh, in Canada, and this is Mike Chevelle's work, uh, into these uh, several different categories. But the vast majority, or more than uh, almost 90% of them, are in the form of diplegia or quadriplegia or that neonatal stroke I showed you as uh, periventricular uh, or um, neonatal uh, spastic hemiplegia. So that's really what... Um, what, uh, uh, what uh, cerebral palsy and, and IV or uh, a hypoxic ischemic injury turns out to be from a phenotypic perspective. And it's also very important to know that about half of them and probably more have uh, some kind of comorbidity in the form of, um, in the form of um, uh, cognitive impairment as well. So we certainly know that uh, the early work uh, by uh, Karen Nelson let, let us know that the etiology and epidemiology of cerebral palsy, 90% of it occurs prior to the time of birth. And we're also recognizing through some work by Steve Miller and um, um, uh, Donna Ferrero that cerebral palsy or um, the phenotypic expression of hypoxic ischemic injury may not only be motor. In fact, there are likely, especially in those kids who are more mildly effective, affected, just cognitive impairment as opposed to motor impairment. And so there's quite a, a continuum along that spectrum, and it's important to recognize that. So hopefully what you've gleaned from the pre previous few slides is that peri uh, perinatal asphyxia is clearly complex. And how it turns out is very dependent on gestational age. In other words, when does it happen during particularly that last trimester of uh, pregnancy? What's the underlying cause? And we'll get into that a little bit uh, more in terms of infectious etiology versus ischemic etiologies. And how long is the injury? 
how, how long has it occurred either intrauterine or around the time of birth to affect either white matter individually, gray matter individually, or a combination of the two to result in both motor and cognitive impairment. So let's take a few minutes to talk about what the mechanisms of brain injury are. And the last 25 years, probably uh, less, has really informed us tremendously. So we're really smart, we think we're really smart, about what causes brain injury, but we haven't really been able to translate that and what we're going to do about it with the exception of really hypothermia and a few other things. And like I said, I think the next decade is going to, is going to change that. I think we're going to see some dramatic alterations in how we'll be able to protect babies' uh, brains. At least that's my hope before I retire. <laughs> so why do we get uh, differences uh, in, or why do we, why do we get um, cerebral palsy and what causes brain injury? So this is a, a wonderful slide done uh, years ago um, that really is just an injection of dye into the blood vessels of, uh, of a baby's brain, obviously a baby who didn't uh, survive or several babies that didn't survive. So you can see at 24 weeks of age, there's not really a lot of vasculature that has developed. Uh, this is the cortex, this is the surface of the brain, and over here would be the ventricular side of the brain. And what you can see is that there's really a lack of blood vessels within the, ventric or within the periventricular region. And the surface vessels, these big thick vessels, which represent the middle and the anterior and the, and the posterior cerebral artery, are all joined into one. It's a, really a single big blood vessel. Uh, and so there's a lot of anastomoses between them and they, they tend to help themselves. So if there's a drop in blood pressure uh, in a 24 week baby to all the way to 32 weeks, and these are all joined up, then the most likely place for injury, or the so-called watershed region, it makes sense, is around the periventricular white, white matter. And so that's one of the reasons why white matter is so vulnerable to injury in the preterm infant. At 32 weeks, that's starting to fill in, and you still have uh, so the arteries up here at the surface of the cortex, they start to separate they become so-called end arteries. Uh, and the ones that are going down into here are starting to join up. So there's this still a bit of vulnerability in the periventricular region, um, but that is evolving over time so that by 40 weeks, this is, um, uh, these are separated. The periventricular arteries are all joined up, so it's no longer uh, sort of a watershed region, and the watershed region is between the big vessels in the brain, the anterior, the middle, and the posterior cerebral arteries. So if there's a drop in blood pressure, that's the region that's most susceptible. So preterm babies, lack of blood vessel uh, formation around the white matter region. As you move towards term babies, the watershed region or the lack of blood vessel development is really between the major vessels, and that's why we get uh, brain infarctions or so-called watershed infarctions. But there are other reasons for the white matter to be uh, uh, susceptible to injury in, in the premature infant. And this is uh, Steve Bach's work at, uh, uh, from uh, Oregon. I don't think anybody has come close to doing the kind of work that he's been um, doing. And he's really um, uh, identified why uh, periventricular um, white matter is susceptible to injury and he believes that it's this cell that's most susceptible. So it's the so-called oligodendroglia or the cell, the brain cell that forms white matter which is the coating around the um, wiring of the brain and all it does is to help conduct, to conduct electricity through your brain just like uh, in the wire in your house, you've got the copper, which is the axon, and the insulation, which is around it. The insulation is the white matter in the brain, and it, and it works essentially the same. So if you take that away, you've got a problem. And Stephen has shown that uh, the pre-oligodendroglia, which, uh, which is present somewhere between 24 and 32 weeks gestation, is the, the cell that is most susceptible to injury. 
Uh, so it's not only that your blood flow is different during that time, it's also that there's an intrinsic vulnerability of that cell to injury, and we'll talk a little bit about it in, uh, yeah, as we go along. So what happens when you get an ischemic injury? You get a, usually a lack of blood flow and a lack of oxygen and a lack of sugar to the brain. And the first thing that happens, and damage can't happen without it, and this is work that I did with Bob Venucci and uh, that group years ago, is a drop in energy. So you get ischemia or asphyxia, your energy level uh, drops very dramatically and usually within the first minutes of that occurring. And what we, we showed as, uh, as we went on, we did some cell culture work to figure out, well, how much of that energy has to drop before you actually see brain damage? Uh, and this is work that, that we did in cell culture when I was at the University of Saskatchewan. And what we found was that neurons and astrocytes really need to drop their energy level by about 75% before you're going to see any brain damage. And that's been shown by others as well since that time. And that's an important number because, number one, number one you've got actually quite a bit of leeway. I mean, if you have to drop your energy by 75%, that's a lot. It also recognizes that, you know, all the sodium, potassium, and calcium pumps in your brain uh, and in your brain cells that are just trying to keep the house, uh, the cell membranes intact, take up about 50 or 60% of the energy supply of your brain. So once you use that, and once you drop below that, your house essentially collapses, the cells begin to die. And then all kinds of bad things begin to happen. You get a release of uh, so-called neurotoxins or glutamate into the brain, uh, and that um, is, the newborn is more sensitive to that than other, um, than even the adult, because your glutamate levels are much higher in the newborn than they are in the adult. And they're higher because they have a physiologic reason for being there. They stimulate uh, the development of the brain cells and they stimulate synaptic and dendritic uh, formation. So there's a lot of it around because physiologically, under normal circumstances, you need it. But when something bad happens and it accumulates within the, uh, within the brain cells and in the synaptic clefts, it causes injury. And it causes injury by, by allowing calcium to, um, uh, to increase within the cell. Uh, that creates an inflammatory response and free radical production. Uh, that inflammatory response can go on for weeks, and I'll show you in a minute, probably months in the newborn. And so you have a huge period of time during which the brain is still susceptible and having ongoing injury. And eventually, res and sorry, here's that slide that shows, this is a, actually a recent slide by Winterhall in 2012, where he showed that the inflammatory process in, um, in the newborn, it fluctuates over time, but he actually showed that it can go on for as long as seven months, which is, you know, huge. Nobody really thought that. We all thought it could go on for days and probably weeks. But here he's shown that it probably goes on for much longer than that. Again, suggesting that, number one, injury is happening for that length of time. And number two, we have an opportunity to do something about it uh, during that, that window. So during the first hours are important, but, but we shouldn't forget that there's a process that's going on for, for hours, weeks, and uh, days, and probably weeks beyond that. Um, Contributory to what happens uh, as a process of that hypoxic ischemic injury and inflammation, we all know that sort of the fetal inflammatory response is playing a huge role now too. So chorioamnionitis, uh, which um, uh, is basically a fetal inflammatory response, increases the risk of uh, cerebral palsy somewhere between two and four fold, depending if you have histologic or clinical forms of uh, of inflammation. And that's been, you know, uh, shown by Pierre Grasson and his group in, uh, in Paris. This is a model of uh, a rat model, the typical seven-day-old rat model, where he injected LPS into the brain and just basically shows here that the amount of myelin-basic protein uh, 
is reduced uh, in, in uh, this is the control, is reduced in the brain of, um, of rats that have been injected or have had an inflammatory response going on compared to what we would see in control. This is the corpus callosum, and it's nicely myelinated in the control, but there's a lack of myelination in the, in the, um, uh, in the animal that received uh, uh, LPS or an inflammatory uh, stimulator. So we know that inflammation plays a huge role along with ischemic injury and go both hand in hand but also as separate occurrences so that you can get chorioamnionitis as well as um, uh, an ischemic injury uh, contributing to each other. And this is just a complex slide. You don't really need to even look at this. But basically, I, I think the, the, the message that I'd like you to see here is that you know, when you inject, when you have an inflammatory response, you really stimulate, stimulate a host of inflammatory uh, uh, mediators that, that it would, one, one would think it would be impossible to have a single drug that would basically dampen each of those processes. And that's probably why we haven't been successful to date, is that we typically like to find a single uh, a single drug that'll stop all of this. But this is just one aspect of the injury or the cycle of events that are occurring in order to cause uh, brain damage. And it's, and it's hugely complex. Um, you know, stimulating interleukins, TNF-alpha, toll-like receptors, etc. Uh, and, and they can be mediated uh, through the microglia, either through ischemia or through infection. And, and really just create uh, a cycle of uh, neurotox neurotoxicity, uh, reactive oxygen species, and inflammatory meters that result in injury to the oligodendrocyte and to the neuron. Um, so, so at the end of the day, that all results in cell death some of which is acute, the necrotic cell death that we all know about resulting in collapse of the house or explosion of the house because of uh, too much um, water going into the cell, or so-called programmed cell death or apoptotic cell death, which results in destruction of the nucleus and an implosion of the cell occurring over a very long period of time and likely uh, occurring for those days and weeks and months afterwards. So very complex uh, system. I'm going to jump through these slides a little bit. This is from uh, Volpe's work where he, uh, or a review paper where he looked at uh, periventricular loc locomolation. This just summarizes what I was trying to tell you in the last few slides. Cerebral ischemia resulting in a reduction in blood flow to the brain, uh, changes in uh, carbon dioxide, an infection inflammatory response that may be um, uh, contributory to, uh, to that, and then a very maturation-dependent vulnerability of the oligodendroglia due to excitotoxicity and, and free radical formation and its ex it, uh, intrinsic vulnerability to that. And, and just to emphasize that intrinsic vulnerability, Stephen also looked at some uh, oligodendroglia in cell culture and he added a bunch of glutamate to it to see what they would do. And this slide just shows us that the oligodendroglia, as well as uh, axons, um, are ex ex in, in this um, developmental process are extremely sensitive to the glutamate, causing a, a rapid reduction in the glutamate receptors, which results in a buildup of the glutamate outside the cell and, and death. Um, by, uh, by neurotoxicity and uh, reactive oxygen species. And that occurs largely because, again, during that developmental phase, the fetus is really not prepared to do anything about this. The fetus is not mature enough to deal with these um, excitotoxins and free radicals the way an adult brain is because their enzymes and uh, free radical scavenging mechanisms are not adequate enough. So physiologically, that's great. That causes all kinds of development. But pathologically, when those, uh, when those um, uh, increase in nature abnormally, 
the fetus is unable to deal with it. So here we have um, glutathione peroxidase, which is an enzyme that um, helps to uh, promote fr uh, endogenous free radical scavenging uh, or um, uh, um, is, and, and catalase and um, uh, SOD that try and also help free radical scavenging. And they're really in this phase where the uh, baby is most prone to periventricular locomalacia at their lowest numbers below, below what one would expect to see in an, adult, in an adult. So the baby itself, the fetus itself, doesn't have enough of the enzymes to quench the free radicals that are hanging around under pathologic circumstances. And this is just a cell culture to show that uh, in baby brains, this is a work by Folkworth and others who have actually looked at uh, pathologic material from baby brains in the periventricular region. And this is staining for oligodendroglia, and you can see nice processes coming from there with good imagination. And here, those processes have been really are dead and dying. And so it's not only that the cells themselves die, but the, but the extensions of them and connections between the others between the other cells are dying, again, resulting in, obviously, uh, the phenotype of cerebral palsy. So this just summarizes the maturation-dependent uh, factors that, that cause PVL, uh, vulnerability of the, uh, um, of the oligodendroglia uh, at that stage of development, excitotoxicity, and to some extent, uh, an inflammatory response uh, through uh, microglia. All of that is happening in the subventricular zone where the cells are being made and where they're shooting off to the uh, cortical surface. This is work by Steve Levinson. And all of it occurs in a maturation-dependent fashion. So again, this is where the, the uh, paper by Volpe, and, and it, it's worthwhile going through a read. I won't take you through all of this, but basically, what we're, try what, is, what we're trying to say here is that at different stages of, the de of development, whether it's 20 to 24 weeks, 24 to 32 weeks, or 32 to 36 weeks, you will get a different phase of development being affected. And therefore, your phenotype, what the baby turns out to be later on, will also be affected in a different way. Whether it's white matter injury affecting the uh, periventricular region and interfering with uh, axons being formed between the cortex and the thalamus, or whether it's later on and they're forming between the cortex and the cortical spinal tract, or simply those within the cortical surface and uh, interfering with cognition, it will be very age and uh, time and development uh, affected. And that's summarized there. So again, just to, to summarize, what we tend to see over the evolution in the last trimester is uh, brains that are being injured early on, mostly uh, resulting in, in PVL, or evolving to a combination of, of white matter and gray matter injury as the child becomes older. Clinically, we tend to see this uh, when the baby comes out as, as being an, an ischemic or a neonatal encephalopathy. And this is already referred to. We tend to score it by looking at a SARNAT uh, score, which is divided into the three stages, as you all know, and measuring level of consciousness, neuromuscular control, complex reflexes, um, and respiration. Um, we tend, as neurologists, to look, sort of look at tone and reflexes more than the respiratory and cardiovascular aspects because it gives us an indication as to what the actual encephalopathy score is. Uh, others have been working on moderating that score. This is uh, one that was done at a San Francisco that has actually included seizures, whereas the Sarnat score doesn't really include seizures, and it also includes um, feeding. Um, because that's a, a real reflection of brainstem function and whether or not a child is able to feed or suck early on can give us an idea about the extent of that encephalopathy. Nowadays, if you have a fancy uh, place and you can do uh, MR or MR spectroscopy, 
We can certainly look at the brain uh, with diffusion weighted imaging and see where injury has occurred. In this baby, this is a T1, we can see that injury has occurred in the basal ganglia uh, portion of the brain. Uh, and in a diffusion weighted image that turns black uh, and that lasts for about 10 days. And so you, can, you do have a window of time where you can uh, relatively time the injury of the brain. And one can also look at some of the metabolites in the brain where lactate is produced under circumstances of an acute injury. And again, measurements often done from the cortex or the basal ganglia or N-acetyl aspartate is actually reduced. And again, it can tell you where in the brain it's, is, uh, is injured, what cells are being injured, and to some extent uh, help us with timing. And this is just uh, showing that in, it can occur in the basal ganglia, but it can certainly also be seen in the watershed regions at turn between the, uh, between the major vessels. So we'll talk about this uh, another date, but um, certainly along with hypoxic ischemic injury, there are many contributing factors that you all know about. Seizures, hypoglycemia, thermoregulation, carbon dioxide concentrations, humidity, and gender and sex. And I'll speak about each of those uh, on one of the next days, but I just want to touch on the gender and sex because this is becoming one of the new hot topics. Whereas we felt that uh, maturation was important uh, before, what we're finding is that it's actually important in term or in the newborn as well. So what, um, what Lee et al. did in 2005 was to look at uh, different, uh, at, di at cultures of cells from uh, different males and females and added uh, a neurotoxin or N NMDA uh, to the culture, and he did find that both males and females didn't do very well uh, when uh, NMDA was added, but he found that relatively speaking, the women, as usual, did way better than the men did. So you all know that men do better, or women do better than men in life in general, but even as newborns, uh, males tend to do worse than females, and that's true uh, even in cell culture. And when they looked at, uh, at an oxygen glucose deprivation, they found basically the, the same thing occurred. And when they added estrogen to the culture, they found that both males and females actually improved. So that, that probably has a message for all of us males out there. Um, this is work that we did uh, looking at uh, gender and sex differences and looking at recovery with um, environmental uh, stimulation and what we found that again uh, when we when we looked at the enriched environment so this is basically physiotherapy for rats when they are in a, um, an enriched environment circumstance the males um, really don't respond very well to the um, uh, to the enriched environment compared to the females which do and that's uh, true uh, for two uh, two of these different types of uh, of uh, uh, tests and foot faults and uh, looking at sensation as well. So some pretty consistent literature coming out now that there are gender differences even in the newborn and that's going to dictate to us to some extent how we're going to therapeutically intervene at some level. Last couple of slides. Um, biomarkers is becoming a really big hot item in, in all forms of diseases now. We did a systematic review a couple of years ago and looked at a host of different biomarkers that have been tested uh, in uh, newborn babies. And really, many of them are, uh, have been shown to be uh, somewhat um, effective in terms of helping us determine which babies will do bad and which babies will do good. But the biggest ones on the, on the hit parade were interleukin-6 and uh, um, uh, neuron-specific uh, enolase. The point of this is that, um, and there's a, actually a large European study, I think, going on that many of you may be involved with, that biomarkers is becoming prevalent, that we can probably find a biomarker that will help us determine which babies will do bad and which babies will do good, and that'll help direct some of our uh, interventions for sure. And that's leading us to really to personalized medicine. 
you know, if we're, if we're looking at biomarkers, if they're going to be different in, in males than in females, and we're going to uh, find what they are, that'll be a really dramatic and, uh, and transformational change in how we treat these uh, children. The same has is, is been true for looking at biomarkers in human newborns, and they looked at, uh, the Italian group looked at a host of, um, of uh, uh, ox uh, reactive oxygen species in the urine and found, again, them to be somewhat predictive of outcome. So just to conclude, um, perinatal brain injury obviously occurs over a continuum of time and over a continuum of development that's really complex and, and makes it really a moving target. And I think that's partly why we're having such a tough time figuring out what to do for many of these babies, because everyone is unique and, um, and each one is exposed to different kinds of injury. And we're going to have to become somewhat personalized in our approach to treating them as we move forward. Um, it's complex in nature and affects both white and gray matter, and that may differ um, during the antepartum and interpartum period. There's many causes of that injury, some of which is topographic and vascular, and other is due to intrinsic vulnerability of the developing brain, um, and will require really a very personalized way of approaching these babies as we move, um, as we move forward. So I'll end there, and uh, thank you very much for your attention, and certainly if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Far, far back there. Sorry, what was the first part of your question? I missed that. I wonder if over-enthusiastic correction of hypoxia by ventilation, begging in the labor room can worsen the situation of the newborn brain. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think probably the other people here who are going to speak to some of these issues can answer that better than I can. But I, I usually tell my residents and fellows that when they're doing anything to take a step back and take their own pulse before they become too enthusiastic. Um, I think we're certainly, you know, we're certainly finding now that uh, hyperoxia uh, may be more of a challenge than we originally thought. Um, hypercarbia. Uh, or hypocarbia is probably a contributing uh, factor to some of the injury we're seeing. Um, at temperature regulation, again, certainly a contributor, and I'll speak to that in uh, the next couple of days. Humidity, I believe, is probably a contributing uh, factor. So, in answer, I think the, the, the short answer to your question is yes. I think we need to figure out what those contributions are uh, and then deal with them appropriately and, and really, to some extent, have a, a bit of a simple approach first in terms of just trying to maintain basic physiologic parameters before we, um, before we go too crazy with, with medications and drugs for these, uh, for these babies. And you can, you can do a lot just by maintaining appropriate physiologic parameters and and that that'll i hope i'll, I'll address that and i think tomorrow yes Periods 
Yeah, it is a hot topic. Um, there's been some work done um, by some of my colleagues actually in Edmonton and others on resuscitation with hyperoxemia. I, I don't know that we have the entire answer to that. You know, again, I think we, we tend to, uh, certainly in the animal world and I think in the human world, you know, find something and then apply it all across the board. So if, you know, when you refer to hyperoxemia, you sort of apply it that it's bad all the time. Um, and same with hypoxia. And that's probably true under some circumstances. But I, I suspect that it's that that we need to look more specifically at when it occurs, the degree to which it occurs, um, and how it actually affects the brain pathologically before we can determine whether it's bad or good. Um, uh, there hasn't been much literature suggesting that it's good, uh, and hyperoxemia in and of itself may well cause sort of cell damage that will lead to the more cognitive aspects of, of uh, difficulties in babies as opposed to those large infarcts or holes in the brain that we typically see with periventricular locomalacia and, and, uh, and stroke in the baby's brain. So certainly what Steve Miller and others um, in, uh, in, um, in Europe have found is that even in those premature babies that, that don't have uh, substantial MRI, uh, typical MRI changes or standard MRI changes. When you look at them more specifically to look at um, the white matter uh, damage and um, uh, fractional anisotropy, there actually is damage there. We're just not seeing them, seeing it with standard imaging. It requires a much uh, greater technique. And so it's, it's likely that hyperoxemia causes damage at a more subtle level than we're typically used to seeing. And from a human perspective, we're not seeing the outcome of those results until children are older, right? Because they're not, they're not displaying them uh, before they can talk or, or do things like that. So it takes some time for them to grow into their, into their deficit. Is that what you were thinking or no? <laughs> Yeah, no, she's shaking her head, no. <laughs> no? Well, we can talk about it after then. Okay. <laughs> All right then, thank you very much. I think there's a bit of a break now.